All right. Okay. Well, uh, happy Monday. Uh, time is just ticking right along, isn't it? So, uh, yes, question. Are they not posted? Did I make a mistake? No, you know, I always forget to do stuff like that. Yep. Okay, give me a second. Okay. Um, yes, so it is um, week five, uh, Monday. Uh, election day is, uh, is next week. Uh, I think uh, early voting is, uh, is open in a lot of places now, so I think you can vote. Um, you know, if you're not sure how to vote on, you know, there's a whole bunch of like propositions and different things. Um, if you are registered in Los Angeles County, um, I am a fan of this site, LAist, and they have um, something called the Voter Game Plan. And in my opinion, it gives pretty um, informative, like it gives you good information about some of the different propositions and things uh, that are on the ballot. Uh, just because a lot of these things, you're not quite sure perhaps what, um, what, what is happening with, uh, with some of these things. It's, they're certainly not getting as much publicity as, you know, maybe the presidential um, uh, campaign. But, um, but you, you know, it's, uh, I think it's good to uh, stay informed, so um, you can do that. And also, I just want to say, if you're not sure how to vote, you don't have to vote on every single proposition or, like, sometimes there's, like, judges that are up for election and you have no idea who these people are. I would say if you have no idea who any of those people are, it's probably better to leave it blank rather than just picking someone where you're like, oh, I like the sound of that name. Okay, so um, that's that's just my um, my opinions there. Um, but uh, uh, but anyway, okay, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, at today's lecture. We are covering. Um, well, we're introducing uh, Markov chains. Okay, so um, we have been talking about uh, generating uh, values from probability distributions. We've seen a couple methods. We've seen inverse CDF method. We've seen uh, convolutions. We've seen rejection sampling. Um, and and the whole the, the reason why we want to even generate random values in the first place is sometimes, especially in the context of Bayesian statistics, there is often some kind of function and some kind of expected value that we want to find, the, you know, estimate the expected value of something. Okay, and it's based on some kind of random variable. And, you know, that, that element of randomness, which says, like, sometimes it's this value and sometimes it's another value, you know, kind of throws a wrench into some of our calculations. And sometimes solving those integrals, solving these things directly is tough. And so um, our approach is to do Monte Carlo estimation. And so this whole class Monte Carlo methods is all about kind of like, how do we deal with, deal with these tough probability or mathematical problems by just kind of estimating them using basically computer-generated randomness. Um, we like inverse CDF method, um, but sometimes it's hard because we can't find the CDF, okay? And then um, rejection sampling is a, a decent alternative, okay? But, um, but depending on the situation, it can be inefficient. And so I'm gonna give you an example where rejection sampling is uh, inefficient, okay? So let's say we wanted to generate values from the T distribution with three degrees of freedom, and, uh, and then we fold that T distribution in half, okay? So this is, so it's kind of like the folded normal, but it's gonna be a folded T distribution with three degrees of freedom. So the T distribution and the normal distribution are quite similar, however, uh, the t distribution has much wider tails than the uh, the normal distribution. So, you know, it approaches, you know, as x goes to infinity, it approaches zero, but it approaches zero at a much slower rate than the uh, the normal distribution. And that, 
that is going to cause us some, some issues. So when we did the folded normal distribution, we said we want to, uh, we did rejection sampling, and we generated values from the exponential distribution. Okay, so we generated values from the exponential distribution, and um, you know we found a constant m by which we can multiply the PDF of the exponential distribution, and then we rejected values uh, so that it fit the folded normal. Okay, so we might say, well, you know that worked well for the normal distribution, so let's try it for this situation. Okay, so here's the PDF of the t distribution and I've multiplied it by 2 because again I folded it in half and uh, and then here's the PDF of the exponential distribution and we want to uh, we want to try this out okay um, so what we need to do for rejection sampling is we need to find a value m so that m times g of x is going to be greater than f of x for all x and we said the most efficient choice for what m is is going to be f of x divided by g of x and we find the maximum value of f of x divided by g of x okay and when we do this we run into a problem because we look at the denominator of f of x and you know we have 3 plus x squared squared so you know whatever it is it's on the order of x to the fourth power okay Whereas the tail of g of x down here is basically 1 over e to the x. Okay, so the numerator decays, approaches, uh, approaches 0 on the order of 1 over x to the fourth, and then the denominator approaches 0 on the order of 1 over e to the x. Okay, so it decays kind of much faster, right? And so, you know, the T distribution is heavy tailed. And so what this means is that no matter how big of a value m that we choose, a finite value of m, eventually as x goes to infinity, m times g of x is going to eventually be less than f of x. Okay? And I can kind of illustrate this, right? So here is in red, we have um, we have f of x, okay, the, uh, the t distribution, 3 degrees of freedom in red, and we have the exponential distribution in orange, okay? And it looks okay, um, and it looks like, okay, well, they're both kind of going towards zero out here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just zoom in, okay? If I zoom in here, okay, so here I'm going to multiply uh, the blue line, um, the exponential by, say, one and a half, okay? You know, multiply the exponential distribution by one and a half, and it looks like it's larger than the uh, t distribution. But then, if we zoom in here, okay, eventually it crosses, right? And the t distribution in red is higher than the exponential distribution multiplied by one and a half, okay? So that cross happens around 5.5, okay? So I can say, okay, well, what if I pick a larger m? Okay, so here's m is two. Okay, so now it's much higher than the t distribution. t distribution is in red. Exponential distribution multiplied by 2 looks like this. But again, now if I zoom in at, say, 6, okay, we can see the uh, exponential distribution in blue ends up going lower. And then the t distribution, which, again, heavy-tailed, doesn't decay as fast. And so now, again, we run into the problem where um, it's not generating enough values, okay? And, and you can keep trying larger and larger values of, of m. If you try m equal to 6, okay, um, around 8, you run into that problem. And you can start to see, even with m equal to 6, well, okay, and then uh, here's m equal to 60, right? Um, and at m equal to 60, it still crosses, okay? It's not until it's around 12, okay? It's not until it's around 12. So you might be like, well, you know, what's the probability of us generating a value of 12 in the first place? And you could say, okay, well, you know, even if it crosses at 12, I'm just going to ignore it and say this is good enough. But look at look at what happens. If your m is equal to 60, okay, what, what is the area under the red curve? 
the area under the red curve is 1, okay? The area under the blue curve would be 60, right? Because we've multiplied the PDF of an exponential so that the PDF has an area of 1, but I've scaled it up by a factor of 60. So the area of 60, and then so again, you know, what percentage of values or what proportion of values will I be accepting? Okay, remember, I'm kind of like throwing darts underneath the blue line, and I only accept values that fall under the red line. If I'm using, say, m equal to 60, okay, then I'm going to be accepting basically only 1 in 60 proposed values, okay? So, you know, we might argue and say, like, okay, when you have m equal to 60, this is going to be accurate, okay, as long as x is less than 12.274, which is going to cover, you know, 99.5% of the values, okay? And so this is not even a 100% accurate. It's a compromise of a solution, but it's not a very good compromise of a solution because I'm now only accepting one out of 60 proposed values. So, so this is just not a great way to go about it, okay? Rejection sampling when you have some kind of heavy tail or you don't, if, I mean, <laughs> with, with the t-distribution, we could find the inverse, okay? Uh, and we could, we, we would use inverse CDF method. But there might be other scenarios where you have an F that is difficult to invert, but you also run into this problem where um, you just don't have a great kind of proposal distribution, okay? So an alternative is uh, to, to start using a markup chain. So oh, here's, a, here's just kind of some code demonstrating the rejection sampling where I've used M equal to 60, okay? So again, here's my F and here's the exponential and I'm going to propose random values from the exponential distribution. We're going to generate random uniform values to decide whether or not to accept or reject. We calculate our acceptance ratio, F divided by M times G. Uh, we will accept it. Okay, we'll get true or false values, logical values. If we do, if U, that random uniform value, is less than my um, uh, acceptance ratio. Okay, and then when I subset um, my accepted values, I've only accepted 1,609 values, even though I proposed 100,000 values. So I proposed 100,000 values using the exponential distribution right here, 10 to the 5, I've proposed 100,000 of them, but I've only accepted, uh, you know, 1,600, so around 1 in 60. So, so not, not the most efficient uh, thing, okay? Um, I mean, it, to uh, go from a folded T distribution back to the full T distribution, we could just flip a coin, and if it is negative, then it becomes negative, and so like half of my values will become negative and half will remain positive. So I'm just going to sample 1 or negative 1, and then my random T value will be my 1600 accepted values multiplied by a random positive or negative sign. And this approximates the T distribution, but again, you know, it's, it's rather inefficient. I've, I've had to generate 100,000 random values to get just a sample of 1,600. So, um, uh, so we can do that. Um, and we can run uh, a KS test, and it passes the KS test when I say, hey, compare my random T values against the uh, theoretical uh, CDF of the T distribution with three degrees of freedom. And it does pass the um, Kolmogorov Smirnoff test to see if uh, a sample has come from a specified distribution. So that, so that, you know, that's a good sign, but, um, but it, yeah, very inefficient. Okay, we're only accepting around one, one point six percent of the values, and it's not going to correct the, produce the correct um, number of values uh, for this. Okay, so we have different. Um, there's better ways for generating values from the t distribution. Another is. Uh, the box uh, modification of the box Mueller transform that you can apply to the t distribution. There's different things that can be done, um, but uh, what we're going to introduce today 
will be uh, will be Markov chains uh, as a as a solution for this. Okay, let me give you your first uh, answer for today's quiz, and that is the letter D. D as in dog. Okay. All right, so I wrote, uh, while we do have an elegant transform solution for the T distribution, there are many other scenarios where rejection sampling is efficient and such a transform solution does not exist. And, and in, in especially in higher dimensions, rejection sampling can become uh, very inefficient. And so Markov chain Monte Carlo can, uh, can produce the sample that we want to do. Okay. So, uh, so this is what we're going to do. Now, when you do um, MCMC, the samples you produce will end up being, will have this property of uh, the val random values produced will be correlated with one another. So that's a, uh, that, you know, that comes with certain issues that you might have to correct for later. Um, and you, you might just throw away some values and, you know, reduce the efficiency, but you know, in exchange for more accuracy. Okay, um, but you will get correlated samples that are uh, approximately uh, from a desired target distribution, okay? Asymptotically, as your number approaches infinity, it will hit that target distribution, but, you know, we don't have uh, infinite time. Okay, so uh, let's introduce Markov chains to start off with, right? And we are going to start off with the discrete time Markov chain. There is continuous time Markov chains, but we'll start with the discrete one. And it, uh, we'll just stick with the discrete one. We'll, uh, this is not a stochastic processes class, which you'd have the kind of continuous time and things like that. But, but anyway, uh, discrete time Markov chain, you have basically time, you know, time one, time two, time three, time four, so on and so forth, countable. And it's a as a stochastic, stochastic process. And what that just means is that this is going to produce a sequence of random variables. Okay, so you think about random variable, and then you'll get another random variable, and then another random variable. And, uh, you know, depending on the process, those random variables could be independent of each other. In the Markov chain, the random variables are not independent, okay? Uh, the random variables instead satisfy what we call the Markov property, okay? And the Markov property, all right, this is, it looks like gibberish here, but it's saying that the next random variable, the random variable at time n plus 1, okay, given all of its history, right? So you can start at the beginning of time, x at time 0, to x at time 1, x at time 2. So knowing all of the history up through x at time, uh, so basically we're saying what's going to happen tomorrow given everything that's happened in the history of time up to today, which is x at time n, and yesterday, x at time n minus 1, and all the way back to x at time 0, day 0. Okay, What's going to happen tomorrow? We can simplify that question down to what's going to happen tomorrow depends only on what happens today, okay? X at time n plus 1, uh, you know, depends on x at time n, okay? So this is the Markov property that um, a lot of times when we think about what's going to happen in the future, we have to consider like the entire past, okay? And the Markov property basically says what's going to happen in the future depends only on what is happening right now. Okay, So x at time n plus 1 given everything in the past can be simplified to x at time n plus 1 given x at time n right now. Okay, And so the Markov property is also kind of known as the memoryless property in that like you just um, imagine like what's happening now and then what you're going to decide just depends on now, you know, whatever events happened in the past, you haven't learned from those, okay? Um, and so, you know, what you're going to do next just depends on what the, the, the state of things now, okay? Um, so, uh, so that's what we have, okay? So, and, and this is kind of 
just an illustration of, I guess, a sequence of random variables. And so we have x at time 0 leads to x at time n plus 1, or x at time 1 to x at time 2, all the way up through x to time n and x at time n plus 1. Okay? And then uh, we have a definition, the state space, okay, is the collection of all the possible values that you can get for all of these different random variables. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, the Markov property means that the probability that the chain moves to state J, okay, on the next state only depends on the current state I uh, and not on where the chain has been previously, okay? So we will only consider Markov chains with countable or finite state spaces, discrete state. So this is a discrete state, discrete time Markov chain, okay? Um, and we will write the space state space as 0, 1, 2 if it's countable, or 0, 1, 2 up to n if it is finite. So we have countable, countable infinite, and countable finite <laughs> as far as state spaces go. Okay. And um, and so we define what we call the transition prob probability of a Markov chain. Okay, as a conditional probability. Right, so we're going to say probability ij, pij, is the probability of, uh, of going to state j at time n plus 1 if your current state at time n is state i. Okay, so pij is the transition probability. Basically, today you are at state i. What is the probability that tomorrow you'll be at state J? That's the probability IJ. So it's like today, I'm trying to think. Uh, like classic is like weather, right? Today is sunny. What's the probability that tomorrow will be sunny? Or today is sunny. What's the probability that tomorrow is rainy? Okay, raining. Um, tomorrow is raining or raining? What is, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, that's uh, that's what we have. Okay, so that's that's the prob transition probability ij. Pij is the probability of going to state j if you're currently at state i. Okay, and you think about that for basically all of these things. So um, if we have a bunch of different states, we can create a big matrix. This is called the transition matrix P, and uh, we have P00, P01, P02. Okay, so this is if I'm today I'm at state zero, what is the probability I stay at state zero tomorrow? If today I'm at state zero, what is the probability I go to state one tomorrow? If I'm today at state zero, what's the probability I go to state two tomorrow? Okay, and then here, this the next row. Today I'm at state one. What's the probability I go to state zero? Today I'm state one. What's the probability I stay at state one? What's the today I'm at state one? What's the probability I go to state two? So, so the each row. Okay, because this is basically like if today I'm at state zero, I have to go somewhere, right? The sum of all the probabilities in a row will add up to one. Okay, so each row will uh, will add up to one for all of these things. Okay, and then this is a matrix of probabilities, so everything has to have a probability of zero or more. Okay, so everything has to be non-negative. Um, yeah, so that, those are kind of the two required probability. Uh, Properties, everything has to be non negative, and everything, each row has to sum to one. So let's start with a very simple, simple example. Okay, we're going to have two possible states state A and state B, and this is how we might draw a transition state diagram. Okay, so I've got state A, state B, and we have a total of four transition probabilities. We can start at state A. And we can go back to state A. We can start at state A and go to state B. Okay? Or we could start at state B and return to state B. Or we could start at state B and return to state A. Okay? And so, you know, A could represent sunny weather and B could represent not sunny, which would include clouds and rain. I don't know, whatever else. I think those are the only two weather conditions we have in Los Angeles. Is Sunny or clouds or rain. <laughs> I don't know if we have. Um, I'm 
I'm trying to think when it last snowed or something, some some kind of precipitation other than rain. <laughs> so sunny versus clouds. Okay, clouds and rain. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I just made up some numbers, but this could qualify as a transition state, okay? Each row adds up to one. All of the values are non-negative. So we could say if you're at A, if you're currently at state A, the next day of returning to state A is going to be 0.7. You have a 0.3 probability of transitioning to state B, okay? And so that's indicated by this top row. So um, you think this is... Uh, the you know top left is A A. Um, this would be probability from A to B. So going from A to B is 0.3. Okay. Um, this bottom right corner is the probability of B to B. Starting at B, returning to B is 0.6. And then this one is going from B to A. Probability of starting at B and returning to state A. Okay. So transition probability matrices. There's no requirement at all for it to be symmetric or anything like that. Okay. This is not. Um, it's not like a correlation matrix or something like that. There's, there's no property of being symmetric. Everything just has to be non-negative. Rows have to add up to one. Okay, so uh, I think this is all uh, listed out here. So, yeah, okay. Um, so that, that, that would be an example of a two-state model here, all right, uh, with a transition state diagram and then the corresponding uh, matrix. All right, here is another example of a Markov chain, all right? And we will talk about the, the process that produces a sequence of random variables and the transition probability there, okay? So this is the called the Ehrenfest Earn model. And this is kind of this classical mathematical model for the diffusion of molecules through a membrane. It, it, it seems kind of wild, <laughs> but there was a time where, like, we didn't understand that, like, you know, air was a bunch of tiny, like, molecules floating around, right? We just, we thought there was, like, an ether and things like that. And, like, now, now like, you're in second grade in we teach you about molecules and air is like things are floating around and so it feels like oh well everybody knows this but no this was like had to be a, a thing that was developed and um, one idea of like how does you know how does like stuff mix right uh, you know if someone is smoking you know, on the other side of that door, like eventually, like will you be able to smell the smoke and things like that? Um, there is kind of this um, diffusion, right? And so the kind of this classical method is like, okay, if we just think about one molecule moving at a time, okay, we could treat uh, the two sides of the membrane, okay, as these two urns, okay? One urn is labeled A, and one urn is labeled B, and in total, the entire system has a total of B molecules, okay? But we'll, we're gonna model this as balls or marbles or something, okay? So we're gonna have a total of uh, N balls in, in, in both of these urns combined, okay? And at each step, we're gonna just randomly choose one of these balls, okay? And we're gonna move it from one urn to the other. So I might randomly choose a ball and I go from urn A and I move it to urn B. Or I might randomly choose a ball and it goes from urn B to urn A, okay? So uh, we're gonna just choose this. And what we're gonna do is uh, we're going to, our random variable, xn, will be the number of balls that are in urn A at time n, okay? And so uh, you could have anywhere from zero up to n balls in that urn, okay? So it's possible that every single molecule is on A, in, in A, urn A, okay? It's also possible that, uh, and your value would be N, and it's also possible that every single molecule is in urn B, and your value for A would be zero, okay? Um, those are unlikely, but uh, but is, it is possible, all right? And so we, would, we just wanna kinda see, all right, what is the, um, that sequence of values, okay? Um, 
and our state space of possible values is anywhere from 0 to n. Okay, um, so if we have a total of uh, i balls in urn a, okay, and a total of n balls in total, okay, so if we ha currently have i, uh, the number of balls in urn a is i, then at the next step, okay, either we're going to take a ball from urn b and put it into a, or we, and our next value will be i plus 1, okay? Or I take a ball from urn a and I put it into uh, urn b, and then the number of balls in urn a will go to i minus 1, okay? So if I'm currently at uh, the number of balls in urn a is i, at the next step, it has to either go to i minus 1 or i plus 1, okay? There's no... Um, in, in our model, there's no option for it to just stay, okay? Because we're always, we're always moving something from somewhere, okay? So, and then the ball is chosen randomly among all of the n balls, okay? And you know, we're going to assume each ball in the entire system has the same probability of being selected, okay? So therefore, the probability that a ball is going to be chosen from a particular urn is going to be proportional to the number of balls that are in that urn, okay? So here is a diagram. If we have, I mean, this is kind of silly when you have only four, uh, four balls in total, but it, it allows me to draw every single possible, um, uh, possible thing, okay? So here we have a total of four balls in the entire model, okay? And we're gonna start off with, at time, and we have two balls in A, which means I have two balls in B, okay? And I'm gonna select one, one ball at random. So it could be this uh, ball number one, it could be ball number two, it could be ball number three, or it could be ball number four, right? So uh, with a probability of one fourth, I select this ball, and I'm gonna move it from urn A to urn B. So at the next state, my A will be uh, equal to 1, and I will have three balls in B, okay? So my the next uh, value uh, will be 1 if this is the case, okay? Uh, I could also uh, select this one, and again, this, this one has a probability of 1 fourth, right? And, and if I select this ball, then at the next state, um, A will uh, have... Uh, Sorry, the random variable n plus x at n time n plus 1 have a value of 1, okay? If I select this ball from b, then at the next... Okay. At, the, uh, at the next uh, interval, okay, I'm going to have 3 at uh, uh, time n plus 1, okay? And if I select this one, I'll have... 3 at time n plus 1. So out of the four possible things, okay, there's four possible uh, balls that can be selected. Two of them would end up with x at time n plus 1 equal to 1, all right? So therefore, the probability of going from state currently at n, x at time n is 2, ending up at x at time n plus 1 being 1, okay, that probability is 0.5. And so that transition probability has the label probability 2-1, okay? It's currently at 2, moving to state 1, that has a probability of 0.5, okay? And then uh, likewise, probability 2-3, P2-3 has a probability of 0.5. That is a probability of beginning at uh, state 2, right? I have two balls in A, and ending up with three balls in A, okay? Going, uh, so x at time n is 2, x at time n plus 1 is 3, so that's probability 2, 3. That probability is 0.5. Okay. Um, here is what would happen if I'm currently, if x at time a is, I'm sorry, x at time n is 3, meaning I have 3 balls in a, okay, what, what would happen? Okay, so if I select uh, ball number 1, Okay, at the next step, I would have two. If I select ball number two, at the next step, I would have two. If I select this ball, ball number three, at the next step, I would have two, okay? 
And then if I select this ball, okay, ball number four, at the next step I would have four. So the probability of going from three down to two, okay, so probability three, two is 0.75 because that would happen if I select any of these three, um, uh, I guess, uh, if I select one of these three balls, then um, that could happen where I currently at three and I go to state two in the next iteration, okay? But it's also possible to go from state three to state four, okay? And that's gonna happen with a probability of 0.25, okay? So P32 is 0.75 and P34 is 0.25. So if you take that and you fill out the entire transition matrix, okay, it's a five by five matrix, right? And you can think about what all of these things are, zero, 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 one, zero, two, zero, three, so on and so forth, okay? So we saw, um, we did basically the calculations for this and the calculations for this, okay? Or I, I, you have, we had diagrams for this. So we said probability of starting at state two and going down to state one is one half, probability of starting at state two and going to state three is one half, okay? And there's zero probability of going from two to two, there's zero probability of going from two to four, and there's zero probability of going to two to zero, okay? Because we're only moving just one ball at a time, okay? If we're currently at state three, we can go down to state two with a probability of three-fourths. We can go, whoops, up to state uh, four with a probability of one-fourth, and zero probability anywhere else. Um, and you could also imagine if you start off with four balls in state A, okay, then you have to go down to state three, right? Because you're going to select one ball at random and you're going to move it from A to the other side. So at the next, at the next step, there's a 100% probability that you will be down to state three, okay? And then there, you know, we're moving just one ball at a time, so the probability of ending, ending up anywhere else is zero. And, uh, and so this is what the transition probability matrix uh, looks like okay so if you have a total of four balls in your entire uh, system um, uh, you have a total of five possible states zero through four uh, your state space is zero through four and then um, this is what your transition probability matrix looks like okay I don't know why this pick diagram looks all funny but uh, but yeah, um, you could start off at state two and you have a one half probability moving up to state three. Start off at state two, one half probability moving down to state one, okay? If you're at state three, a one fourth probability of going up to state four, a three fourths probability of going down to state two, okay? If you're at state four, one, just a probability of one of going down to state three. And, uh, and so this is uh, what the transition probability matrix looks like in this kind of uh, state diagram of the different values you can take and basically the probabilities of, of going anywhere else. And we don't have any probabilities of kind of going, returning back to itself directly, right? Like you cannot go from four back to four. So from four, you have to go down to three. If you're at three, you can go up to four or down to two. If you're at two, you can go up to three or down to one, but you can't go from two back to two or anything like that. Okay, so that is, uh, that, that's an example, uh, another example of a Markov chain. And that is the Ehrenfest Earn model. Okay. Um, what's going on here? Let me give you your second answer. Second answer today is the letter C. C as in cat. C as in cat. Okay. Um, so in general, for uh, if your system has a total of n balls, okay then the probability of going from i to i minus one is gonna be i over n. This means you selected one of the i balls that are currently in urn A, okay? And that's gonna happen with probability i minus uh, i over n, okay? And then the probability of selecting a ball from urn B and moving it to urn A, that's gonna happen with the probability of basically how many balls are in urn, urn B, what proportion of the balls are in urn B, and that's gonna be one minus I over n, okay? So those are your two transition probabilities, and then basically zero probability of anything else, because either we're gonna move one ball from A to B, or one ball from B to A. So that's the Ehrenfest earn model, okay? 
Uh, we'll do uh, another uh, Markov chain. This is the random walk, just kind of another uh, classical example of Markov chains um, is, uh, is the random walk. And this is used to model the path an object or a particle can take as it moves through space or, I don't know, like a, an insect walking along or something like that, okay? Um, Oh, some a application of particle of path takes as it moves through a liquid or a gas in continuous time. This was Brownian motion. That was the thing that Einstein won the Nobel Prize for, I think. Maybe? I don't know. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right. And then, you know, other things. Going up or down. Stock prices. Stuff like that. Okay. So we will look at what we consider just a one-dimensional random walk. Okay. So you just have kind of this number line going off to infinity in that direction and negative infinity in that direction. You're going to start here and you can either go to the right, to the right, or to the left, things like that, okay? And, um, you know, how do you go, okay? So you're going to start at zero at each step. You're going to move to the right one unit with probability p, and you will move to the left with probability 1 minus p. So you could imagine flipping a coin. If it's heads, you go to the right. If it's tails, you go to the left. Um, and maybe your coin is uh, not a fair coin, and so maybe it has a bias towards moving to the right, or maybe it has a bias towards moving to the left, or whatever, right? If you want to think of a coin, some, some kind of thing where you're spinning an arrow. Oh, no. And so maybe, but anyway, uh, you just kind of do a random thing. Probability P of going to the right, probability 1 minus P of going to the left. Okay, so if, you're, if you start off at 0, you could either end up at 1 or negative 1. Probability you end up at 1 is P. Probability of ending up at negative 1 is 1 minus P or Q. And if you're currently at state uh, i, whatever you are, if your current state is i, then you're either going to end up at i plus 1 or i minus 1. Okay, so it's, a, it's you know, not too different from the Ehrenfest urn model, except our state space goes off to positive and negative infinity. Okay? So we can go to i plus 1 or i minus 1. And this is a Markov chain with transition probabilities, okay? And we're going to go to, um, if you're currently at i, okay, we can end up at i plus 1, j, uh, ending up at j I is i plus 1 with probability p, or j is i minus 1 with probability q, and 0 otherwise, right? And now we can't draw a probability matrix because that would go from, you know, our state space is negative infinity to positive infinity, so I can't draw that transition probability matrix. But we have kind of the transition probability rule for that that we can kind of handle, right? So um, we can also express this, the random variable, or uh, our random walk can be expressed as a sum of iid random variables. Okay, so we can think of each, um, we can think of a y as being either a positive one or a negative one. Okay, basically you move, you're gonna, whatever your value is, you're gonna add a one or you're gonna subtract a one. Okay, so you can add a one with probability p or subtract a one with probability q. And then your Markov chain x is gonna be, you're gonna start off at zero. And then you're going to just add, basically, uh, a y is 1 or a negative 1 to get your next value of x. Okay, So rather than um, necessarily saying, like, OK, I'm currently here, and we're going to go add 1 or minus 1 with the, these probabilities, we can just kind of generate a sequence of plus 1s and minus 1s and then kind of take a cumulative sum of all of these things. And so we can uh, generate our Markov chain uh, like so. So I can just say, all right, we're going to, I want a thousand of these things. We'll just do an even coin flip. P is 0.5, Q is going to be 0.5. And I'm going to just randomly sample either a one or a negative one 
with probabilities P or Q, replace equals true, and then we'll look at this kind of the cumulative sum. And here is kind of one thing. So yeah, sometimes I go to the right and I go positive, sometimes I go to the left and go negative, and just sometimes you get a whole bunch of negative values in a row, right? Just this is like a streak of a bunch of tails when I flip the coin. And, uh, and after a thousand coin flips or whatever, right, up and down, up and down, up and down, I went as far as negative 40. Uh, I guess the highest I ever got was maybe positive eight or something, okay? But up and down, you know, a bunch of ups and a bunch of downs, okay? So anytime you see kind of this wiggle up and down, this is like heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, right? But anytime you see kind of the sequences like tails, 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 heads, tails, 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 heads, heads, something like that, okay? Um, and that's that's what we have, okay? Uh, here is just another, I just did the exact same thing, but I just changed my random starting seed. And this time I got a whole bunch of heads in a row, okay? Heads, 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 tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, whatever, okay? I ended up as high as plus 50 or something, right? So these are just two different examples of how the random walk can take uh, can take you, and if you let it run long enough, technically, yeah, you can go as high as plus infinity or minus infinity. Um, you know, unlikely, right? Uh, but uh, but yeah, you can get you know really far out there. So um, anyway, that is uh, that's kind of our, just our brief introduction to Markov chains, and we'll we'll start talking more and developing these and talking about how do we design Markov chains to fit our, uh, our needs. Um, but let me go ahead and give you your last view quiz answer.